Okay, I think I'll get us started. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you really for joining us. It's, uh, it's great to see so many people signing in here for this session. Uh, and in particular, it's great to see people coming from all over um, Alberta and beyond as, you, as Ryan pointed out in the last few minutes. Um, my name's Chad Park. I am uh, the co-chair of the Possibility Panel along with Emma May and I'll be the host for our session today. I, I will say a little bit more about the background in just a moment, but um, I, will, I will share with you that uh, for those of you for whom this is your, uh, your first session with the Next 30 or the Possibility Panel, the format for this is intended to be, and I think you'll find is, is quite interactive. So we'll have you interacting on the, on the chat box. We'll be using Slido as well to gather your ideas and opinions, and um, and uh, and we'll be hearing from some panelists and so on. Um, before I get too far into that, uh, I will. Well, okay, here's the, uh, the agenda slide that's up in front of me. Um, I'll say that for those of you who have been at e earlier sessions of the Possibility Panel, um, because this is the third one, uh, the format is going to look familiar. We're doing a similar format where we'll, we'll do some welcome and introductory context setting um, um, points and then help frame the issue. We'll give a little bit of background uh, as well. And then we'll hear from uh, some of the members of the possibility panel who will each share uh, for about five minutes each on some of their ideas around the, the topic. And um, then we're going to get you working in smaller groups and we'll harvest some of your ideas and, uh, and then have some closing reflections from a few other members of the Possibility Panel. All of this is meant to gather um, ideas uh, about what's possible for Alberta on this topic. And when I say this topic, I'll, I'll just share a bit more on that right now. The topic obviously is energy and climate. Hopefully that resonates. Hopefully that makes you feel like you've come to the right session. It's um, a question that's posed is how might we ensure Alberta's energy sector thrives in a low carbon emissions future? And I'm just gonna say a couple of things about the topic before we get into it. Um, from, I think from our perspective and from, I guess, my own perspective, in many ways, this is an issue that defines much about Alberta's place in the world right now. And we, we, we could just look to the news every day. There's news on this, on this topic that, or that somehow connected to it. It is really at the heart of some of the, um, the issues we're, I guess, considering and exploring together about our relationship with the rest of Canada, about the United States and you know, the rest of the world. And, and part of that, of course, is because this is a global issue. It's not just an Alberta issue. And really this is about how do we show up in relation to that, to that global issue. But I don't think, um, I don't think we can understate the fact that this is a highly polarized and polarizing issue and set of issues. And, um, and in that sense, it, it, of all the topics we're exploring with the Possibility Panel in the next 30, it, I think it, it's arguable, but it could be the case that this one might be the one that illuminates most strongly the differences we have uh, in terms of different visions for Alberta's future. Um, so, all of that is, uh, you know, is context. I, the other second point I want to make is that um, with my experience as, a, as a, one of the, the founding members of the Energy Futures Lab and having worked in that space over the last several years is that despite all of that contention and polarization that it is actually possible to find alignment on these issues and, uh, and, and, and to align stakeholders and people with very different points of view and very different um, interests and so on. Uh, and, and the Energy Futures Lab itself has, has, has proven that. And we'll hear probably a little bit more about that later in the, in the session. But um, that gives me uh, encouragement, I guess, for, for this particular session. We, don't, we know many others have this topic uh, very front and center as their main focus. Um, and uh, so we don't expect that in only two hours together, we're gonna to solve this issue on behalf of Alberta. Uh, but 
On the other hand, um, we can draw on the experience of lots of people and the perspective of lots of people in helping eliminate some of the possibilities. And that's really what the possibility panel is all about, is just elevating ideas for what's possible for Alberta's future. So um, that's how we plan to approach this. And we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but let's, let's go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Um, I've probably by now everyone, most people are familiar with Zoom, but just in case you're not, there's a few little guidelines or people are already using the chat box in the middle and the bottom. You will keep your, your mics off uh, unless you're speaking later. And, um, but love to see your faces in the video. Um, next slide just briefly mentions that we've got, uh, this is a new edition. This is uh, since the last session for the next 30, these um, closed captioning. So uh, if you want, if you like that, if you like seeing the, the text of what's being said across the bottom, that's great. It's there. If you want to turn it off, you just click the live transcript button at the bottom and then click hide subtitle and that'll turn off that, uh, that text that's coming across the bottom. So to start things off, I'll just share that um, for myself, I'm, I'm coming into this session from um, Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton. And Treaty 6 is, uh, of course, traditional meeting grounds of, and, and gathering place and home to the Cree, the Soto, the Blackfoot, the Métis, the, the Dene, and the Nakota Sioux people. And we find it important to do a land acknowledgement at the start for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and in fact, in that work I referred to earlier with the Energy Futures Lab, I had the great opportunity of having a lot more in-depth exposure to the issues surrounding truth and reconciliation than I had had previously. And um, I'll just say two of the things that I picked up, two of the many, many things I picked up from, from that, for example, from a deep dive into these issues um, at the BAMP Center. Uh, one is the importance of of, um, of recognizing the truth about our history. And it's easy to try to jump to the reconciliation part of it and, um, and to focus on where we can find some, some pathways to reconciliation. Of course, we need to do that. But as part of that, it's vitally important that we all do uh, everything we can to learn more about the history uh, of this place and the, um, the suffering of the Indigenous peoples uh, as part of that history and colonization. The second thing I've picked up uh, that I wanted to emphasize is more sort of a key lesson from Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous culture is the importance of the land. And I think that's something that a lot of us, all of us probably can relate to in one way or another. And um, so uh, in past sessions, we have done a little exercise here. We're, we're going to not do it now, partly because I know there are at least 100 or more people who've been to five of these sessions now and done that same exercise. So we won't do it again. But uh, instead, I'll just say for you, to give you an opportunity now to just think about a piece of land or a place that means a lot to you. And um, in the chat box to 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 say something about that piece of land. Where is it? Why does it mean so much to you? So I'll just, I'll just give you a moment to do that now. And as the uh, responses start to flow in, we'll, we'll move on to, um, to the next slide. So as those are coming in, I'll just give, for those of you who are new, I'll just give you a little bit of background on what is the next 30. First of all, it's a not-for-profit organization. It was um, created late last year and launched late last year by a small group of, of us, of Albertans who are concerned about uh, and wanting to create a space for um, forward-looking engagement around ideas about Alberta's future. And we launched this organization with, uh, with an initial project, which is the Possibility Panel. And I'll, I'll just skip to the next slide. 
to say a little bit more about that. Uh, the, so the panel is uh, it's a group of about 30 um, Alberta leaders from different parts of Alberta's communities who are, uh, who are attending these sessions partly to hear your ideas about the future of Alberta and in particular what's possible for the future of Alberta. We're, that's the kind of core framing, what's possible, how do we wanna face the future, what big ideas should we pursue? And do, doing this explicitly in a, um, in a, in a context that's nonpartisan and where we're, we're seeking to, to hear and gather and ultimately um, illuminate ideas uh, for Alberta's future. The ideas from this session will be fed into the possibility panel and a big part of the role of the possibility panelists is to listen. So you'll find that that's what uh, many of them are here to do today. You can go to the next slide. Here are the eight members of the possibility panel who are gonna be featured today. Four of them, and I won't list all their names right now, I'm gonna list their names when we get there, but uh, four of them will be offering some introductory remarks uh, early on in the session. And they all come from different, uh, different backgrounds with exciting, interesting um, ideas to share. And then uh, four of them will be, we're offering some, will be listening and offering some closing reflections toward the end. So I uh, just wanna thank them for being here and, and other members of the panel as well. The next 30 values, uh, here's, here's what we've established as, our, as the values for this initiative. And um, I won't read the whole, the whole tech set of uh, words on the screen, but I will just say respect, nonpartisanship, diversity, long-term vision and collaboration. Um, we've focused in a fair bit in earlier sessions on, on, on some of these values like nonpartisanship. Um, today, I wanna to focus on diversity and what it says there, we value the critical importance of diverse perspectives in finding solutions to the challenges we face. And my experience is that on this topic in particular, and it's probably true of a lot of topics, but especially on this topic, it is very easy to surround ourselves with people who already agree with us. And, um, and given how complex the issues are, how substantial and interconnected all the challenges are, my view, and I think the view why we put this as a value is that uh, we're not gonna find the best solutions and the best ideas if we're only talking to people who we already agree with. So diversity is not just something to be um, tolerated. Uh, it, it's actually an asset that we have to, um, to find our way into the future. Uh, so really value the fact that I think on this call or this meeting, there are surely a very wide range of perspectives on the issues we're gonna be talking about. And with that in mind, we can go to the next slide. Uh, here's, here's some principles we call brave space principles. These were introduced to us by one of the panel members, Tim Fox, who um, uh, comes from the, the Blackfoot uh, tribe territory and, and the Calgary Foundation as the Director of Indigenous Relations or the Vice President of Indigenous Relations. Um, these are our, this is how we encourage you to show up in these conversations. And, and I guess we, that we request of you to try to show up with, you know, living up to and fulfilling these principles. So um, one is we're present in this virtual space with each other. It can be distracting, of course, to have lots of things going on, but um, for as much as possible to try to be present here, to be open to new ideas, new ways of thinking. And part of that is to listen deeply and be curious. We uh, encourage you to bring awareness of um, your, bi your own biases and assumptions and judgments. It's easy to spot what you think perceived to be other people's biases and assumptions and judgments, but also to try to be aware of your own. Um, hold the space for trust and confidentiality, focus on possibility and um, acknowledge and appreciate what other people have to bring to the conversation. And hopefully all of that creates a space to be brave and courageous in the conversation. When there are moments where we might disagree, we encourage you to challenge ideas, not people, and um, certainly not insult people. <laughs> um, that said, if we're not uncomfortable in these conversations, then there's a good chance that we're not growing and we're not uh, challenging ourselves. So allow that discomfort that you might experience in some of these sessions and conversations to be a, a basis of growth. And then finally, take accountability for your own learning. 
um, what you're going to get out of this is 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 kind of up to you and we're going to do our best here of course and we've been gathering feedback along the way about how to improve these sessions and we will continue to do that but ultimately we're all responsibility for what we're responsible and accountable for what we get out of it the only other thing i'll add here is that we um we've got young people uh in on, on the on the in the meeting and i just want to uh i guess reinforce uh, all these principles in relation to those young people. There are some, of course, young people who have maybe have no problem showing up and expressing their opinion in any such circle, but um, there are also young people who, for whom this might be a little bit of a different experience. So we'd really encourage you to uh, make an extra effort to elicit the points of view and um, the voice, hear the voices of, of the young people. Okay, let's carry on. I think I jumped around a bit on the slides there. Slido, this is just the last little intro. Uh, it, so it, we encourage you to do this on your phone because that seems to be the easiest. We'll be asking some questions. If you go to slido.com and you enter the code hashtag next 30, you'll see that there are some questions and uh, we'll be asking you along the way. And, and when you enter your answers there, we'll see all the answers collectively on the screen. So let's test that out now. This first one is for, uh, uh, an invitation for you to indicate your age range. Thank you. So we've got, uh, we wondered what the effect of having the session in the middle of the day or the afternoon would be compared to our, our earlier sessions have been in the evening. Oh, not sure what's uh, happening there, Steph. <laughs> anyway, it looked like there was uh, quite a mixture of age ranges, maybe a little bit more towards um, 35 to 44. But I did spot that there were some, there were, uh, uh, still some young people as well. And I uh, really appreciate you coming out if you're 25 and under in, um, in many ways, and we can skip to the next slide. Uh, in many ways, the, the perspective of young people is, uh, oh, I think we've skipped ahead a little bit here. The, the perspective of young people is, um, we're talking about the next 30 years, um, the people who have the greatest stake in that are the young people. And um, so we actually want to, before we dive into the details, we want to give an opportunity for the, the young people to share some perspective on this topic. And um, I'm not sure, I'm seeing what's on the screen now. I don't know if we have those slides actually. Apologies, Chad, we are having technical problems. Give me two seconds to try and fix it. Okay, no problem. We can actually come back to that um, and we can jump right into the panel then because uh, we don't need slides for that. So um, the, the, the panel members, the first four panel members are here to, to share five minutes each on their ideas about what's possible. We're talking about how we might ensure Alberta's energy sector thrives in a low carbon emissions future. So I'll introduce them one at a time. And the first person I'm gonna introduce is Judy Fairburn who is, I guess her title right now is co-CEO of the 51, but um, Judy's bio is, is way too long to give, uh, to give on, on, a, on a meeting like this, but has an extensive background in the energy sector and the innovation world as well in Alberta. And we're really proud to have you join us, Judy. So take it away for your five minutes. Uh, thanks so much, Chad, for setting it up. Hope that doesn't mean I'm too old. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, it's great to kick off the session today, and I'm going to just provide a few framing remarks from some of that uh, experience and wisdom. Uh, and I've recently pivoted, indeed, very much to the tech world um, and uh, the 51 um, in terms of women-led capital uh, propelling women-led organizations with ESG, EDI at the core. So if I think about Alberta, uh, I was born in Calgary um, and uh, I have lived here much of my life, also stints uh, in Ottawa and elsewhere. Um, Alberta has the Energy Climate Solutions Foundation. You know, we've got a long history 
of leading on innovation um, from a technology perspective, a social innovation perspective. You know, if we think about Energy Futures Lab um, in the oil sector, COSEA, then CRIN, CD, now CDL Energy, Creative Destruction Lab Energy, focused on energy transition. ERA, Albert Innovates, Actia, Pemina, many entities that are coming along. If I missed anyone, uh, you know, nothing intended there. It, the point is we've got a strong ecosystem. Um, and I think there's lots of uh, multi-voice policy, um, great reports that have come out as well, in, in, in particular in concert with the federal and Alberta governments, some of which I and many of you have been involved in. And then I'm encouraged because what, where it's also started to happen is the sustainable finance um, work and some of the stuff that's come out in the last year to really start to quantify what it's going to take to get to the 2030 goals and beyond. And, um, and I think that's all great. However, time matters. We've got a great foundation uh, and we've seen how fast the world is moving on this in terms of Europe, Asia, and now with the Biden administration in the States. And to quote uh, George Bernard Shaw, who I think is, is, the, is the, the originator of this, thanks to Adam Legg for a flag in this, let's not miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Let's not miss the opportunity for Alberta to really thrive um, in a low carbon economy. That's probably one of the biggest things that keeps me up at night. And there, we, we've got that great foundation on technology and how we work together. It's time to scale up the efforts with pace. Uh, to create impact, you know, from an economic and social environmental perspective in all facets uh, of the energy economy. And yes, I come, I'll come from a business perspective. Finance matters um, because that's what it's going to take to get to scale and what we want to do and realize our dreams. And I'm really encouraged, you know, by the, how the financial markets have taken the lead on this, whether it's from ESG, sustainable finance, everything that's going on now in the world. And also, uh, although it's been challenging, sometimes the increasing collaboration that we're seeing between governments, uh, federally, provincially, on finance uh, and with the energy sector on this as well. Um, the regulatory realm, also super key because that's needed to make sure what we see is possible in terms of innovative approaches to energy system can, can, can actually happen. Um, and. Uh, you know, if I, if I go a little bit further to, to the power, I think, here of, of Next30, it's really, really important, indeed, that we listen to the diverse voices um, in this province and backgrounds and, and gender and all facets. Um, because we all know, and we had a great session this morning with Magda Willingham and Nancy Smith, that good decisions are made when we actually have an open mindset we encourage constructive debates. You know, we, we listen in particular to these different questions. And I think that I, I thought of that already and Chad's opening remarks just, just elevates that as well. And you know, what I think we all come to realize is that we actually all have biases. It's just, it's just how we grow up and we set our mindsets. So paradigms, the kind of bias and paradigms are kind of human nature and that we just have to deliberately work through them. Um, and I think what I would say is, What's always encouraged me is we're a very entrepreneurial and pioneering province. We also are home to a lot of progressive leaders, many of whom are on the call here involved. Not all of them have always been hurt over the past decade plus. Um, and, and I want to call out in particular uh, the many amazing women, um, often the hidden figures that have been working for some time and have had the foresight. And, you know, a lot of others on the call, too, that are great. But I think in particular, it's a bit of why we formed the 51, the value of just elevating that and unlocking the, the talent and voices. Um, and so if we uh, look ahead here now, what's also, I think, important is change is hard, really, really hard. And a people-centric energy transition is critical. Uh, we've seen uh, 2020 is a massive time of change and you know you want to minimize the people who are left behind and particular women have experienced job losses a higher rate than has ever been seen in history and so you know echoing that that philosophy of green plus uh, as Sarah and Greer wrote, recently wrote about I mean I'd like to elevate uh, the thoughts on that and you know as I think we just uh, close off my remarks here to kick things off we're in 2021 we only have nine years to 2030. Um, and it's really critical to look ahead through the windshield versus the rear view mirror. Yes, there are people looking through the rear view mirror. Challenge our paradigms um, because we need to accelerate change. Uh, and I think that's the value of, of next 30. And 
you know, I'll close by saying it's great to have the dialogues. Um, I just do it. Execution mindset is critical because again, time matters. This is what keeps me up at night um, to make sure we leverage actually the opportunity for Alberta's low carbon economy. So let's make it happen. Great. Thanks, Judy. That sets us up really well, I think, for the, uh, for everything we have to say. We have lots to build on, but uh, we can't, we have to take into consideration the time and scale are really important here. Um, this is a slide to remind me, because I forgot earlier to mention that uh, if you have questions that you want to ask of the panelists, so Judy and, and the other three who are about to come, um, you can enter them into Slido. And, um, and you can also vote up the questions that you are most interested in. And I'll keep track of those so that when we get to the Q&A section, I can uh, I'll have some questions to draw from to, to post to the panelists. So thank you for that. The second panelist we're uh, going to invite now is Sean Collins. And Sean is, um, he was one of the co-founders of what has become a global student uh, organization called Student Energy, uh, sort of an Al Alberta-based uh, success story we can all be proud of, and um, also one of the founders, co-founders of Terrapin Geothermics, and ge generally involved in lots of innovation space. So, Sean, over to you. You're still on mute. Looks uh, like you're having trouble. There you go. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we're into it. Awesome. Um, perfect. Uh, really appreciate the, the time and being given five minutes at the mic. I'm going to try to go on a bit of a run with the five minutes um, and do something a bit different just to draw a bit of attention to what I think is a bit of the mathematic problem for Alberta's energy system. So this is my quick background. Uh, I've been involved in sort of starting and growing a lot of really interesting organizations. Most of my focus has been on energy, uh, mostly because I grew up in Fort McMurray. Um, so it's sort of been around energy and energy transition since I was pretty young. Um, one of the career highlights for sure was uh, working on Terrapin and helping secure uh, about 25 million bucks from the federal government for our Alberta number one geothermal project. Um, and then as you mentioned, uh, student energy uh, this was about 2008, 2009 that we got student energy going really to be a global leader in how you educate and engage on energy and energy transition topics. Um, and that's been a pretty cool story so far, um, but that's not what I want to use my five minutes for. Uh, really two quick objectives. Uh, the first is to get into the mathematics of Alberta's carbon challenge and how this challenge I think could be leveraged towards Canada's Paris targets. And then uh, using the possibility panel sort of riff, um, what are the possibilities that $170 a ton creates for us as a province and where that sort of maximum value is coming from. So I'm going to do this through a financial model, which this may fail on me, um, but I wanna use this to sort of paint a bit of a picture. Um, so I wanna start off by getting a, a snapshot of what Alberta's uh, per barrel emissions uh, challenges are right now. And so if you do, Pemina has a great report. Uh, if you want to find it, I'll, I'll post these links in the chat sort of as I go. Um, or maybe I'll post these afterwards. But uh, if you're looking for in terms of oil sand intensity per barrel right now, 60 kilograms per barrel. That's sort of the first number that I'm going to use in here. The, the next sort of number I want to draw attention to is just how much production we have. So Alberta daily oil production, uh, oil production, we're about 3.7 million barrels a day. If you look at the government of Alberta number, we're 3.8, 3.7 million barrels a day. So we produce 3.7 million barrels per day. And over a year, that gives us the following, uh, we'll do barrels per year. Ah, this is why it's breaking, sorry. <laughs> um, so that gives us our barrels per year and that gives us our total carbon number. So our total carbon per barrel, or total carbon in a year from our product is 60 kilograms per barrel times our total barrel. And to get that into a reasonable number, we need to divide it by a billion to get it into megatons. So we'll take this number and we'll divide it by a billion. 
and that gets us down to 81 megatons of carbon that's coming from our product per year. And I want to compare and contrast that now for us to see what is our product and how does that stack in the world. And so the per barrel carbon average is about 18. And the current best sort of project marginal product in the world is about six. And as part of the experience of Techstars Energy, I was in Oslo last year when Equinor commissioned a project called the Johan Svedrup project. And the Johan Svedrup project, if you look at the Johann Svedrup carbon per barrel, they're uh, about 0 0.67 kilograms per barrel of carbon. Um, so they're, they're right now competing production online 0 0.67 grams per barrel. And so you can see the impact that that has on your megaton emissions over time. And I want the, the sort of final message I wanna have is how much of this that makes up of Canada's Paris targets if we were to have a significant improvement on our per barrel emissions target. So Canada's current uh, total megatons of emissions as a country is about 729 megatons. If you look, uh, this might be covered up on my screen a bit. We're about 729 megatons. And Canada's Paris target is in megatons is 519 or 517, sorry. So we're about 517 as our target. And so if we were to go from 60 kilograms per barrel to, and sorry, we'll do the gap. So the gap that we need to hit as a country is 212. And if we go from 60 to six, uh, that didn't work out, but we can figure this out anyways. So we'll go 212 is sort of the target. And we want to go from 81 down to six. Sorry, give me a second here, equals 81 minus eight. That would save us 73 megatons per year. And 73 megatons per year is of Canada's Paris gap, about 34%. And so I look at that as an opportunity for Alberta to materially contribute the hardest part of the solution to Canada's Paris targets if we were to take a more ambitious viewpoint on what our per barrel emissions intensity should be. So this was the sort of summary, and I think I've used my five minutes. Um, and, and, and I think that not only represents a uh, significant environmental opportunity, but the value of those emissions at $170 a tonne uh, is about $16 billion a year. And so I think not only do we have a massive environmental opportunity, I think we have a massive economic opportunity if we think about this transition at the right scale. Okay, thanks, Sean. You are the first possibility panelist to create a spreadsheet for their presentation. Way to go. <laughs> That's great. Uh, definitely some good food for thought, I think. Okay, the next uh, panelist we're gonna hear from is Ed Whittingham. Um, Ed is um, also a man of many uh, interests and achievements and um, affiliations, but um, one I'll say is co-founder of the Academy for Sustainable Innovation. And he's also one of the uh, co-hosts of the podcast, Energy Versus Climate, which they had their session earlier today, I understand, their latest episode. Um, Ed, take it away. Chad, thank you. And yeah, what I'm not going to do is create a model on the fly. Holy moly, Sean. That was an impressive piece of multitasking. Um, I have enough trouble with Excel when I'm by myself, and you just did it in front of 200 plus people. So huge, huge props. Um, and as Chad said, actually, with our uh, episode, the webinar pod that I co-host, Energy versus Climate, we had today as a guest, Mark Jackard who presented original Navius and hot off the press is Navius research, looking at the impact of $170 uh, per ton uh, carbon price on Canada's industry and our climate target. So it'll be up the pod in a couple of days to do check it out. So what do I think we need to do to ensure our energy sector thrives in a low carbon emissions future? I, I think the first thing is we have to have a more honest conversation than what we've been having to date about energy transition. Uh, Judy quoted George Bernard Shaw. I'm gonna quote that other playwright, Peter Terzakian, who talks about three stages of transition, disruption, disruption denial, transition. 
I think we're in the early stages of transition, but we still have got lots of people caught in denial and misunderstanding. And we have to try to move them through that as soon as we can. And I say that with a caveat, it's easy to sit here uh, in my house in Canmore and say that on Zoom, but at the human level, when people are losing jobs, and, and Judy mentioned that, it's all too real for them. And understand if people are mad and they're scared and they're, they're in denial, so completely understandable. But I think part of being honest, which is the, the number one thing I think we need to do, it's recognizing that our energy sector has gone through disruption long before COVID. We've got lots of great energy companies that have been struggling to find financing, including ones with good balance sheets. And we're seeing billions a year in capital leave the industry. And oh, by the way, this happens to be Canada's largest export business. So it's of concern to the entire country. Um, but we still, we've got people uh, in denial about transition and the disruption. And we've got, I think, um, within the industry itself, we've got companies that accept transition is happening. And those who think if we just get the federal monkey off our back, if we don't have to labor beneath $170 carbon price, we'll be back in business. But I say that, I, I think we've also got denial, I'd call it on the other side. And I work in renewables, partly. But we've got people who think that renewables can provide the same number of high paying jobs that oil and gas has provided over decades. And, and I think that's another form of denialism. So the net effect of all this is we've got polarization and thus the conversation that we're having today. The reality is we're in the early stages of transition. We've got dozens of companies now that have committed to net zero by 2050. And even if no one knows precisely how we're gonna get there, whether a company, whether as a company or as a country. But the good thing is with, with our companies here, we've been thinking about this for a lot longer than most other companies. Uh, and just like we're way ahead on ESG stuff. And, and what I've seen is a real shift in the tone of uh, let's call them the progressive actors in the industry in just the past 12 months. But part of that, the honesty is recognizing that demand for oil is slowing. Electric cars are getting cheaper, better. Climate policies, as we saw last December, are getting stronger. And now COVID-19 has just accelerated changes at the workplace. And it's going to really reduce commuting and business travel. And at the same time, we've got the supply side of energy, and particularly oil, it's growing. You know, technology change in the past decade has really made oil extraction cheaper and more competitive. So the bottom line, and this is the honest part, is that we're not going back to that long run of triple digit oil prices that's going to float all boats in this province. We're not going to get that hockey stick like uh, production growth curve that we thought we'd get just half a decade ago. And while our oil is unquestionably more ethical than, say, Saudi Arabia's or Russia's, global markets haven't figured out how to price in ethics and human rights into a barrel of oil just yet. And it's hard to imagine they will in a way that really favors our barrels. So another part of honesty is, is talking about how hard this is gonna be for Alberta and Canada. You know, politicians from both jurisdictions, they talk about us being leaders in transition. Uh, I'll steal the analogy of a friend of mine, Adam Watrous, who is the largest investor in Canada's oil and gas industry. And he says, if the whole world, if, if the whole world decided to transition away from wine, we wouldn't expect the French to be leaders. So I'm not sure why we expect Alberta and Canada to be leaders as the world transitions away from oil, our number one export. So what do we do? Well, clearly we need a plan B because I don't think I'm the first person to say plan A to date isn't working. And, and here's what I think we shouldn't do. Conventional thinking has been, we need to pay our producers to transition since many of Alberta's oil producers are in the high cost, high carbon quadrant. But I would say that continuing to invest high levels of public funds into maintaining sales in a shrinking market right now is a bad business proposition. I think that's a bad use of public funds. And I, I say that we should be wary of spending too much on emissions reductions moonshots that I don't think are gonna save the industry. Rather, let's let carbon pricing along the lines of what Sean just showed us and regulation drive the cost competitive emissions reductions that, uh, that the companies can do themselves. And I'm not saying by any means that we should abandon energy. 
uh, like we've got skills and resources in the sector that we can leverage. We can develop new energy pathways. Uh, there's lots of opportunities for say low carbon hydrogen in, in transportation. And I also think we need to capture as much wealth as possible from the parts of the oil sector that will remain competitive. And I say that like most of the oil sands operations there will remain competitive. And let's put that public money that we capture in developing new technologies and new industries. And I, for one, I don't know what the industries of the future for Alberta will be. But when I talk to smart people, you know, we've got a range of options for economic diversification. We've got manufacturing, chemicals, metals, healthcare, big opportunity, clean tech, um, agri-food, agri-tech, education, manufacturing. I think as part of it, we can take a let many flowers bloom approach to quote uh, the great Gordon Lambert. Um, and and let's, let's also recognize we've got this great, young, highly skilled workforce with great education. Uh, you know, some of whom are on this, uh, when we looked at the age brackets, are on this webinar today. And we need to continue to win the competition for the best and brightest who can bring that innovation talent. And lastly, and so I, I'm at the end of my five minutes now, let's, uh, let's accept that the energy sector's ability to provide those high paying jobs will be diminished compared to five, 10 years ago. And that means transition for many working in the industry. And that's, that's a scary word because that can mean transitioning me into not having a job. But I would say it's more scary with no plan. So let's plan for worker transition. Let's think about income replacement. Let's think about retraining and let's have a serious conversation about a universal basic income. And maybe we pay for that for a PST. I think we need a PST. Our, our provincial uh, finances aren't sustainable without it. So let's be honest. Um, look forward to the rest of the conversation. Okay, thanks, Ed. Well, you covered a lot of ground there. You even got a, a, a PSD and a universal basic income into this topic. That was impressive. Way to go. Um, okay, thank you. That's uh, also a lot for us to, to have in mind. I'll just encourage everyone, remind everyone, I guess, to keep in mind the, uh, yeah, keep the comments coming in the chat box. But in terms of questions, if you have questions for the Q&A for the panelists, you could enter those into Slido. And I see some people have done that already. And uh, so if you go in there, you can also vote up the, the questions that are there so far. Last panelist, last of our four introductory panelists here is Kevin Krausert. Um, Kevin's the former CEO of Beaver Drilling and just recently now the CEO and co-founder of Avatar Innovations. Kevin. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chad. And uh, of course, you put me after uh, Ed. I had my whole five minute uh, speech, but there was a lot there that I want to compliment and maybe some unpacking. Um, so first of all, thanks uh, to Next30 for uh, and all of you on the call for, for joining this. This is uh, an issue that is is near and dear, I think, to, to myself and a lot of Albertans and to be able to have a, a, ra a respectful, rational dialogue around this conversation is important in the beginning of how we start to kind of move forward. One of the, the reasons this is deeply personal to me, the energy file is, you know, I'm a, I'm a fourth generation uh, Alberta oil worker. Um, I, my great grandfather worked on some of the first wooden rigs uh, in Turner Valley uh, and the first commercial discovery of, of oil in Alberta. So I know firsthand the opportunities and, and the challenges and I've, I've spent most of my career working in this industry, but you know, certainly to me, um, the industry is changing and I think that's one of the reasons I've, I've been looking at the industry and trying to create some new opportunities for the future of energy. I will take a little bit of a critique on Ed's point of, you know, would you expect the French to, if the world was going to transition off wine, would you expect the French to be leaders off of it? This isn't a question of transitioning off alcohol though. <laughs> um, there, is there solutions inside of their wine production techniques that could potentially be going? The, the markets are changing. And I think that it's a, bit, it's a bit of a misnomer of an analogy because we're not transitioning off energy or nor are we necessarily even tra transitioning off of oil, we're transitioning off of carbon. So there's a little bit of a, a catch there that I think that maybe frames up my, some of my next points. 
So, you know, too often, I think that the polarized side of the debates that Ed was speaking about is, you know, we get caught up in this, you know, peak oil conversation, you know, is peak oil going to happen in 2030 or 2040? Has it already happened? Like BP is suggesting. And you can listen to a variety of groups ranging with, frankly, a lot of their own personal investment theses that are being supported by their forecasts. And they'll be very convincing. Um, but what I can promise you is they're all going to be wrong. And the challenges is we fall into this political trap of, you know, how has COVID-19 impacted behavior? What is going to be the growth of, of you know, the developing world and their oil demand? Green pieces or Exxon Mobil's you're looking at 5% up or maybe 10% down. Um, it's the exact wrong conversation to be having. The right conversation to be having is where do the opportunities lie? And the, to be frank, the oil sands are, are gonna be a really good cash flow generating business for the next 10 or 20 years. They have all the sun capital. Most of their lift cost of production is you know 16 to $25. Um, they're gonna be producing oil for a long time. The challenge for the province is um, the jobs aren't going to be coming back, even if oil prices kind of go forward. And so the question is, how do you find where these um, opportunities lie inside of the industry to be able to go thinking? So if the world's not transitioning off wine, it's transitioning <laughs> off, of, off of carbon. Um, as, oil, as energy production demand goes forward, the solutions that actually exist to decarbonize the industry is most difficult to decarbonize exist inside oil and gas. So the question is, is, you know, Canada is a highly uh, renewable electricity grid. We have more solar or we have more um, hydropower than most companies, countries anywhere. So this conversation that Canada is going to decarbonize through a purely electrical grid situation is a little bit of a misnomer. Where we have to decarbonize is in heavy industry, whether that's, um, and, and the solutions to be able to do that exist inside oil and gas whether that's carbon capture, um, storage, geothermal, long duration storage, hydrogen, these are things we are already doing and we are already good at. So it's like the world's not transitioning off of wine or Bordeaux wine, it's moving to Burgundy wine. We just have to figure out how to shift our means of production of things that we're already doing to be able to do it. And so there's two ways to look at this transition that's happening. One is defeat. They're trying to put us out of business. They don't like wine anymore. But the reality is, is no, they still like wine, they just want other kind of wine. And so we have to figure out how we leverage the skills and the talent that exist inside this industry, inside this province, to be able to build new, new opportunities in the future. And those are the initiatives that I've, I've kind of already mentioned. You know, the, the International Agency is, Energy Agency has come out and said that, you know, it's gonna require something like $54 trillion worth of capital to basically rewire the world to meet its net zero by 2050 commitments. We could look at that as, oh geez, they're putting us out of business. Or we could look at that like, ka-ching, we know how to do this. So we already are doing this. I think, you know, Judy spoke about the fantastic energy innovation ecosystem that does exist. I, I will argue it could be better uh, and we could uh, move a lot faster. But I think the framework's there. I think it's stopped time it, it's not time to, it's time to stop having conversations around when is peak oil happening the conversation is how do we start creating these opportunities in the future and the good news is we're already busy at work so that's my five minutes i went a little off okay thanks kevin we're glad to hear you're busy that's great <laughs> um thanks to all four of you uh i think you've all taken a slightly different perspective on this and given us a lot to, to think about. I'm gonna jump right into the Q&A uh, and this, in Slido there are uh, several questions that have been posed. So I'm just gonna jump right in and take the moderator's prerogative of choosing which ones I'm gonna say. I'm actually gonna go with Bill Cooper's question first. And I, I wonder if this might go first to, to you, Sean, but um, anyone could jump in. Can you explain how we earn funds from reducing carbon? Thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the quickest, shortest answer is by developing an offset project of some sort. And so um, I, my, the optimist in me thought I could get to a second half of that spreadsheet. <laughs> um, so the first half was Canada's 34% or that transition on oil sands would make us a third of Pan Canada's Paris targets. And then the, the sort of second half I wanted to do was if you just Google Canada's largest emitting facilities, there's a data sheet you can download and it just lists all the largest emitting facilities in Canada. 22 of the top 30 are in Alberta. 
And sort of the quickest way you make money off of that is so, so if that's a project where that facility has a natural gas boiler or a petroleum coke boiler that they're using for steam or power generation, and you replace that with a renewable source, um, by doing that, you generate value of a hundred, worth a, up to $170 per ton of emissions. So Alberta right now is we're, we're about 30 bucks a ton for emissions. And so if your project produces more clean energy than is consumed um, and adds new clean energy to the grid, you get that offset value. And right now the prices of that is 30 scaling to 170. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there if that's, if that's the answer that we were looking for. 40 Judy, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Judy, I ask you to jump in too, because you probably have some visibility to some projects that are tangible projects that are reducing emissions and making money and so on. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of them are earlier stage. I mean, we've talked about uh, geothermal and uh, some of the novel companies that are growing very quickly there and they're getting attention around the, around the globe using our leveraging the experience that we've had um, in, in the energy sector. I mean, to, to the question that came up around how do you show people who work in traditional energy sector there's a place for them in the new economy? That's, I mean, I work more in the new economy now and um, with with companies and uh, in the digital realm. And you know, there there's starting to be lots of good stories. I, 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 you know, Calgary Economic Development Board earlier today, lots of great announcements. You know, one of the companies that, that I'm involved with, Verum, you know, and industrial economy. How do you how do you work in a, and and visualize assets without having to go to the field? And, um, uh, you know, it's working really, really, really well. And in the time of COVID, it's, it's gone exponential. And, and these kind of businesses can help reduce, reduce the emissions, almost like the scope three emissions, and also allow us to be, to be broader in terms of exporting um, this kind of uh, services around the world. Um, and so, you know, I think that there is things that are pivoting. Um, and skill programs out there are really accessible now, Edge Up and others. Um, and let's think about our professions of, of, of energy. They're data, data intensive professions um, in terms of the skills of working with math and, and, and the like. And so they naturally, I think, transition pretty well to data science and in the early stages of artificial intelligence, especially for our younger generations. So I guess my, my summary is here is I see so much opportunity, but it takes a mindset of pivoting. And, and leaving your old paradigms behind. Kevin, did you, I know you're working a lot in the investor world now. Did you have something to say on that one? Yeah, I, like in a lot of the, like the, 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 to put it simply is, is what's the price of carbon and is there a demand or is there a cost for it? You know, there is some projects that are at work that are basically using carbon as a feedstock for anything, for everything from greenhouse gas emissions to, um, you know, alcohol to, um, you know, fuels. And, and, you know, there's even some initiatives there. So if those technologies start advancing pretty quickly, I think that there's going to be a revenue source there. And then obviously carbon taxation changes the economics of creating offsets as, as, as Sean was alluding to. Yeah. And Chad, I don't, I don't want to be left behind. <laughs> go ahead. I was on mute, but go ahead. Ed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the highest level, I think people have to understand that there are billions to trillions of dollars sloshing around in the global market looking now for low carbon investment opportunities. And if you can provide that global capital with an opportunity, you can tap into amazing wealth. So there's nothing to prevent our province from tapping into that kind of capital. Not to mention everything we have here domestically whether it's the domestic carbon price, where it's if you below the industry benchmark, you can make money, the clean fuel standard, to the carbon engineerings of the world that, that is building a direct air capture plant, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, great Canadian company in the Permian Basin in Texas, the heart of oil and gas country in the US with Occidental Petroleum, traditionally an oil and gas producer, to use atmospheric CO2 to produce carbon neutral crude oil. And they're doing it off the back of the right policy regulatory environments in the US and that trillions of capital that's sloshing around looking for investment opportunities. Great, I think part of what that does is it reframes the, the math that Sean shared with us from being a problem, uh, which it is, but um, also an opportunity because there's going to be money spent on reducing emissions. We have emissions to be reduced. Uh, so we can be a market for the, the technologies and projects that, um, that are going to be relevant 
um, here, but also around the world. Judy, looks like you want to jump in. Yeah, what, and one more example. We know that methane has uh, way more emissions are way higher in carbon. And I've been really encouraged over the course of last year to just how many innovative technologies are out there now to reduce methane emissions. Interesting hybrid solutions that are coming out of Alberta to use solar power coupled with, with uh, methane emissions to then self-power um, remote operations. It's just one example. Um, and, and many, many more. And so I think if we see, we've got to apply those to a lot of greenfields so that we're not just talking about our brand new projects, but how do we transform the emissions of our assets that are already there and find the transition finance to go with that? Because then I think that'll be a significant piece to bring in down the, uh, the, the carbon profile as well. Okay, there's a very popular question here. How do we create a people-centric energy transition within the polarization of us versus them? and economy versus the environment. Anyone want to take a stab at that? Sean? Sure. Um, I think there's some interesting work that folks like Iron and Earth have been doing around sort of worker-led energy transition and, and how you use your labor forces as sort of weapons of the transition. Um, I think that could also go further, like if we're thinking ideas and solutions. Uh, I think there should be more like worker co-ops in energy it's sort of, you have unions of representing worker rights and stuff, um, but just the idea that uh, the consumer is creating the demand for the energy and should own a piece of that energy and so are the workers. I just think that there's a way to position people more at the core of the business models for our future energy projects, because um, they're not right now. Yeah. Judy, go ahead. Oh, yeah, and I'm, I'm seeing some fascinating new platforms come out that actually starts to give real visibility to communities in terms of their carbon profiles. So you start to almost get a map so that it's, it moves it from being, it becomes then all of our responsibility to know uh, what we're emitting in terms of carbon. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to change the way we all look at it. I think it's like, I think EPCOR's, the city of Edmonton's budget, 25% of that is EPCOR dividends, I think it is. And so I think ownership of it as a community asset and as a revenue stream, um, my property taxes would be way higher if they hadn't owned that energy utility. And so thinking about energy and energy transition projects as a one-time equity ownership opportunity, um, we shouldn't lose sight of that as well. Ed, go ahead. Sure. And I've got a personal story because when I was ahead of Pemina, um, I was very involved in the coal phase-out campaign that led to Alberta's decision, the Climate Leadership Plan in October of November of 2015, to phase out all Alberta thermal coal by 2030. And we thought it was a great campaign win, and, and it was. And it set the, uh, the benchmark for the Fed's commitments a year later. After that, I spent time in Hanna, Alberta, which is home not just to Nickelback, but it's also home to the Westmoreland coal mine and the Sheerness Generating Facility, a coal-fired electricity facility owned by ATCO. And I got to know people who then saw, say, this is great, you're phasing out coal, but to my point, you're phasing out my job. You're phasing out my livelihood. And he saw what happened to property values there. We saw what happened to the workforce. And uh, so for me, part of a people-centric approach is creating that kind of empathy, which I didn't have, from not spending enough time in a coal town like that. What we shouldn't do is when transition is happening, immediately provide corporate welfare to companies. Because we did that back in 2015, 2016, and we kept the coal companies, the utilities whole, and we didn't do enough for the communities. And I think a people-centric approach is inverting that, that we think of communities and we think of workers first before we think of shareholders and keeping them whole. And I think that was a huge mistake, unfortunately, that the last government made. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Kevin, do you want to weigh in on yeah. that one? Or? Yeah, yeah I have a um, couple of thoughts on that. So, you know, I think that there's, you know, I think in your opening comments, Chad, you mentioned this in the sense that, you know, transitioning from an oil and gas job to that pays $150,000 a year to do installing solar panels that once they're installed, you don't need, whereas you're going to have to continually kind of keep drilling oil. Um, you know, the, the jobs are going to essentially kind of be different. The, and then I think also the kind of question is, is like, 
the people centric aspect is, 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 is there are currently 12,000 unemployed petroleum engineers in Calgary alone. Um, put that in perspective for a minute. Um, we're, if, if we're never going to go back to, you know, all these reservoir engineers and all of these individuals kind of going back to work in oil and gas, what are, what are tangible ways for somebody with a highly technically skilled, highly professional individual can kind of be working on? And that's, I think, why we have to speed up on creating these opportunities that we can do um, inside, this, inside this province. So I think the people-centric transition is looking at not just reskilling people for jobs that potentially don't exist, but creating opportunities and in companies and industries where those jobs do exist. Okay. Um, we're going to take this other question that is highly ranked and I'll read it out in a sec, uh, but I'll just, because we're actually a little over time for what we had planned for this Q and I'll just try to encourage you to, in your responses, keep it quite concise and really focused on possibility as a theme. So, in energy transition, I feel like there's an untested assumption that we are trying to maintain our current way of life. Is there room to explore our expectations? It's quite a profound question. Judy, go ahead. I think it's a superb question. And I'd, and I'd say it in terms of what we use in terms of quality of life, in terms of energy, but let me also say it in terms of our what we expect in terms of our compensation, all these other perks that we think, and and you know, being more in the tech sector now than I than I am in the energy sector, I am seeing you know that's a hard transition for people. And if you look at global sectors around the world, um, we have to calibrate that. And so I think to a certain degree, it's important for people to come back to what do you really need? How do you be motivated and get involved? You may not find you're paid as much, but you know a lot of people are high unemployment in this province too. Again, to my opening remarks, don't look through the rear view mirror. Look through the windshield. Look at the possibility of learning, building on Kevin's comments. Um, that's been one of the most energizing aspects that, you know, that I personally have, have taken in the last couple of years and deliberately pivoting from the world that I was in. Um, it's energizing. Yes, um, the dollars and cents and stuff like that, and you have to give up some other things, but that's how we're going to rebuild this province. We can't keep looking through the rear view mirror. Yep. And if I could jump in, Chad, let's, I mean, we've had this, this wonderful opportunity through COVID to think about our lifestyles and what really matters. I mean, I got off a plane from Ottawa, March 12, 2020, and little did I realize at the time that I would basically be sheltering in place in Canmore with a home range about four square kilometers thereafter. And at first, you know, I went through withdrawal. I'm like, gosh, I you know, feel like I should be on a plane somewhere and packed in like sardines and stressed running to this meeting or that. So it took a bit of adjustment. But then I discovered all these things that I wasn't able, quieter evenings or, or family here staying together, playing cards. Like, oh, you know, it sounds like motherhood and apple pie. But we're now living lower down on the hog as a result of COVID. And I don't want to go back to the lifestyle that I had, even if we're let out of our living rooms tomorrow. So, and that, to, to put a dollar value to it, is a cheaper lifestyle as well. So let's take this opportunity. But I said that, I just want to acknowledge, I am lucky, I'm very privileged, I have a job, many in this province don't, and we have to address that. And I really want a serious conversation on a universal basic income. And that's, that's the honest conversation, I'll say it again, we have to drive that in this province. Can I do two seconds, Chad? Go for it, Sean. Uh, just the question of sort of maintaining current way of life. When, and the question of, as that relates to possibilities and energy, um, I don't think we spend enough time talking about the end uses of energy. So we want light. We don't necessarily need electricity into a lamp, into the ceiling to do that. We want heat. How do you get that? Like the end products of energy or electricity, heating, cooling, transportation products, that's pretty much it. And so, so the question of how do you maintain the current way of life it's figure out the end use of, of how we're using energy and can you get those in ways that don't require wires and hydrocarbons. Um, so I think it's a little bit of what Ed was saying, like you don't have to be traveling the world all the time, but also how are we delivering our energy and is a window as good as a light? And sometimes it is. Okay. Thank you all. Um, that was great. Uh, the, the whole intention of that was to explore what's possible and to set ourselves, to set the, the group up for some 
some some deliberations to come in smaller groups and I think you've done a terrific job of illuminating uh, some of the possibilities and to and to reframe some of the challenges that we're facing as possibilities even so thank you very much to all of you and um, we'll we'll uh, we'll hear more from you I'm sure uh, as things unfold but uh, just want to take a moment to thank you and now um, I'm just going to go back to the uh, just before we we get into uh, the next kind of big section, which is where we'll give you a chance to share your ideas uh, as participants. Just want to go back to this part that we had to skip over before because of the uh, the uh, the technical glitch that we had. And as I was saying, we we want to hear from the young people on the in the meeting about specifically about what they want to see for the future of the province on this topic. So um, we're gonna trust you here uh, in, in terms of this next request, you'll see the next slide, which is if you're 25 or under, please answer this next question uh, on Slido. And we're, nobody's gonna be policing if you're uh, actually over 25 and answering it, but we would, would trust you to do that. And so you can go to the next slide or to the, um, yeah, the poll. So in one word, what do you want to see, uh, young folks? <laughs> in Alberta's future in terms of energy and climate. Responsibility, opportunity, decarbonized, innovative, conservation, forward-looking, sustainability, education programs, anti-racist, resilience, okay, here come a few more, interesting that so far it looks like we've had 20 responses in 20 different words. But there are some themes to this, it seems. Wealth, security, self-awareness. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much. This gives us a sense of what uh, the young people on the call are hoping for. And we want you to keep that in mind as we head into a discussion about how we might achieve all of this? How might we ensure that Alberta's energy sector thrives in a low carbon emissions future? So to do this, we are gonna go into breakout groups. Just before I send you into the breakout groups, I'm just gonna remind you of, or for those of you who've been here before, this is a reminder for those who haven't, this is new, maybe. Um, this is this is some, uh, I guess, a, a, a mental model to have as you go into these conversations, because you're about to be put into rooms with a bunch of people you don't know probably. And um, I, will, I will say, I hope that doesn't scare you off because so far the feedback we've received is that people love these breakouts and the idea of colliding with sort of random strangers from across the province and talking about these issues. Um, so I definitely encourage you to, uh, to dive into this. But as you do so, here's um, work from Otto Sharmer. Talks about four different ways of engaging conversations. So one is on the bottom left in the pink is talking nice. And that's where everyone's really polite, but nobody ruffles anyone's feathers. Um, and to the right of that is talking tough, where you're, it's all about debate. You're listening to the other person mainly for the purpose of figuring out what your next argument is going to be to defend your point of view and so on. But we would really encourage you to try not to show up in those two quadrants and rather to show up in the top two, especially the top left, but, um, which is generative dialogue. Uh, the, the orange one is reflexive, where you're curious you're, you're showing up with curiosity. You're trying to understand what other people are saying, listening not for the sake of defending your point of view, but for really um, understanding. And generative dialogue is where you're listening for the sake of trying to find connections to your own point of view. So that's where we, that's the fertile ground for co-creation. So um, that's just an encouragement, uh, the spirit with which to, or mental model with which to approach these uh, breakout conversations. And um, so, there will be four questions or sort of four steps in this. We won't have any facilitators in the room, but at the top of your screen will be 
uh, every few minutes will be a, a little encouragement that will appear to uh, urge you on to the next step in the conversation, I guess. And uh, I think the next slide just shows what those four steps are. We go there, yeah. So first is obviously introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from. Try to try to do that fairly quickly, and then share an insight. So something that resonated from the panel, or one question you're asking yourself after hearing that. Something just something that kind of reacts to what you've heard so far. And then the third step will be a, a personal story. So just share with your group a personal story about in really about the topic. Why does this topic matter to you? What's your experience in relation to it, and so on. And then what the remainder of the group time will be a uh, group discussion on what ideas do you find most compelling for Alberta on this topic. Um, you don't, we're not creating the expectation that you're going to reach a consensus in your breakout group in this small amount of time. Uh, so it's just to kind of surface a few of the ideas that you find most compelling. When we do the harvest back after the breakout groups, every individual will have a chance to share their own thinking and their own ideas. So I hope that's clear. I encourage you to enjoy the breakout room. I guess the only other thing is in in relation to the brave space principles earlier, if there if there's any reason why you're finding yourself uncomfortable in the conversation in your breakout room, um, just feel free to leave and come back to the main room and we can I would want to hear why, but also we would uh, we would be happy to reassign you to another group. Okay, welcome back everyone. I think we have uh, all the breakout groups back now. Hope it was a fruitful discussion. I'm anticipating that you likely solved most of Alberta's challenges in those breakouts. So look forward to hearing about, about it. Um, what we will do now is, uh, is have a, um, what we call a harvest and it's just to gather the ideas that you have in your heads as you listen to all this and you brought into the conversation as well. So um, the way we're going to do that is on Slido again. And you don't, I just want to reiterate, you don't need to, for this part, you don't need to um, reflect any kind of consensus from your group or anything. We're just we're gonna ask each individual to give a response to this question. What's one idea or what one idea, sorry, do you find most compelling to help ensure that Alberta's energy sector thrives in a low carbon emissions future? And just before uh, you go into answering that, which you'll do on Slido, I just wanna give an example. This is um, an idea, just one example of an idea that uh, I'm familiar with from my work with the Energy Futures Lab and Alberta Innovates is championing this one, bitumen beyond combustion we can drive innovation to find alternative uses and markets for Alberta's bitumen, such as carbon fibers, so beyond burning them. This changes its carbon intensity from a liability to an asset. Um, that's an example of something that's already happening in the province and we could maybe do more of. So I, I just share that as one example, um, and mainly because it's just to encourage you to use as much of the 300 characters that Slido allows for this response as, as you can, so that it's as descriptive and specific as possible in terms of the idea that you're putting, putting out there. So we'd much prefer that to sort of one word answers, uh, you know, in, for, for this particular exercise, if possible. All right, so, um, We'll move into Slido and and um, and look forward to seeing what ideas you have to put forward here. How do you plan to share the harvest with us? Um, I will say a bit more about that toward the end. Yeah, and I guess I should have mentioned as well that if there are any of these ideas you're seeing from other people as they come up on the screen, then again, you have the opportunity to, to vote them up and indicate your, that you, you find them compelling by, by clicking on that, on the, on the thumbs up. And that'll just give us a sense of which ideas this group in, at least finds most compelling. Hey Chad, as an old guy, how do I, what button do I push to put in my comments? Okay, yeah, sorry, I didn't see who that was, but you just go to slido.com on, on your phone, um, or if you don't have a phone there with you, then you could open it on the second, um, 
on the second window. And on that website, it'll ask you for a uh, code and you just enter hashtag next 30, as it says there. Okay. And, then, and then the question will be there for you to type your idea into. <sighs> so far, some of the ideas that are um, people are finding compelling, particularly compelling, hydrogen, grow an export market for hydrogen created in and around Edmonton in particular, bitumen beyond combustion, um, indigenous lead, geothermal, tapping into a clean source of energy and keeping our oil and gas skills and infrastructure at their highest and best use. Pivot, not abandon oil and gas. Now oh, there's the, the term from earlier, a people-centric energy transition. Uh, another one around hydrogen, hydrogen development. And um, take the politics out of the discussion. Instead of vilifying oil and gas, acknowledge its contributions, both past and future. Each transition over is electricity to be 100% clean. Our greater exploration of what role nuclear power could have in ensuring strong power and reducing emissions while using expertise from retrained Albertans. Grassroots solutions to couple renewable energy to food security. Climate batteries, grain crop dryers driven by renewable sources, etc. Carbon capture utilization and storage. The province has the infrastructure knowledge and technology. There's another nuclear. Quick wins, digital transformation, methane emission reduction, blue hydrogen, carbon capture, storage, utilization. Great, well, thank you. We've got um, at least 68 responses in there and we've also got a sense of what people find some of the most compelling ideas. And you can keep keep voting on those and keep entering your ideas for another uh, couple minutes here. And as you're doing that, I'll just I will respond to that earlier question about how you'll hear back. So on first of all, we'll provide a a quick su summary of this session and also a link. Um, eventually, there'll be a, a recording of this that'll be available. But um, we're also going to be working on, on um, synthesizing the ideas and conversation from this uh, and, and sharing that uh, first with, uh, with all the participants here and also with the, the possibility panel members. And all of this will be input into, into their work. And we haven't sorted out um, exactly how that's going to happen, but there will be a moment where um, that synthesis will be brought back to people who are interested in talking about it and um, and working through some of the ideas. So um, there'll be follow up uh, in a few, maybe a month's time or so on this topic and other topics as well. So 85 responses so far, thank you. Lots of support and interest for hydrogen, geothermal, bitumen beyond combustion, um, not abandoning oil and gas, and so on, indigenous led. Great, well, I will mention, and I'm gonna say this again later, that we have other sessions of the Possibility Panel coming up in the next uh, month or so that address some of those topics. There'll, there'll be one on talent, there'll be one on, um, on truth, reconciliation, and indigenous opportunity and um, one on health and wellness. And we'll, we'll share more about that in a moment. Okay, um, let's move on. Thank you for that. Now is the moment where we're going to turn to four other members of the Possibility Panel to share, uh, share some of their reflections. We've asked them to listen carefully um, to, to the session and, 
and reflect on uh, now for two minutes on what they've heard and their own reflections in relation to that. And I'm gonna throw you for a little bit of a loop um, by asking Larissa Crawford to uh, go first, if you're ready, Larissa. Larissa is the founder of Future Ancestors. And if you're ready, I'd love to have you go first. Great, thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna just share my screen and thank you for adjusting the schedule just because I have to pick up my daughter from preschool. Um, so I'm a big note taker um, and I was taking notes and I was, I was using Miro. It's a great um, digital platform to um, take notes. I just shared a link in the board or in the chat for you to see. Um, so these were just kind of like the, the key things that I was hearing as a possibility panelists were, were speaking. Um, and so I, I'm gonna speak, I'm, I'm gonna use the rest of my <laughs> tip. Yes, we did the Action Canada Fellowship together and I was big on my notes. Um, my reflection I wanna summarize actually in questions. Um, in looking at um, what this discussion evoked for me. Um, the future depends on our literacy of the past. This comes from Kimmy Kang. While taking into account the urgency of driving the low carbon future forward, acknowledgement of the harm caused in its establishment, so of the past um, energy systems, we need to put attention to that still. Um, and making sure that our future actions are informed by an understanding of that harm. Um, and so I wrote out some questions and I'll just use the rest of my time to read out these questions that I think we need to continue to center as we think um, future forward. Who was missing at the decision-making tables in the last energy transition? Thinking to indigenous, black, racialized peoples, women, youth. What was the impact of their absence and like really sitting with what was the impact? And then how effectively are we engaging these groups now and being critical about that? What policies, regulations and cultures of the disrupted energy transition caused disproportionate harm to people? So in my mind, I'm thinking, how do we make sure that in offsetting carbon and transitioning um, through these energy systems that we're not seeing the kind of impacts that mancaps had on communities and Indigenous women. How does this need to inform the energy transition we're currently amid? And then who received supports in the past energy transition? And that really goes to Ed's point about investing in corporate over community resources and support. What impact was felt by those neglected in how those supports were allocated? And then in moving forward, how do um, supports need to be created in response to, to the different barriers and needs of communities affected by the transition and recognizing that um, it's not going to be a one size fits all. So that's, um, that's my reflections and I, I included the link to my notes um, for anyone who wants to, to see a, a deeper analysis of that. Great, thanks very much, Larissa. Um, I like the notion of of um, leaving us your reflections with more questions to consider. Uh, and that's, um, and these are powerful and important questions. I appreciate your perspective there. We'll let you go to your, do your daughter. <laughs> um, next, I'm gonna ask Ryan Richardson. Uh, Ryan's uh, with, uh, with um, Radical, uh, Manager of Global Markets and Strategy and um, long career in the energy sector. So uh, Ryan, go ahead. Thanks, Chad. Uh, some impressive panelists so far working in real time. Larissa with her very impressive notes. Sean walking us through a financial model. Literally feel like building the, the plane as we're flying it here. Uh, super interactive and cool. I've learned a lot the last couple hours. Uh, one thing I learned, you know this common phrase, the devil is in the details? Where, you know, it's like there's something hidden in there and you can greenwash maybe something over it, but there's detail to get in there. I learned today that that old expression came from an older expression call, call, that was commonly said, God is in the details. And that's because, you know, the details have not just those bad hidden things, they have all sorts of hidden concepts, good and bad. So it's more that the God is in the details was more like you should do things thoroughly. And, and focus on the details. 
And I feel like energy and climate, you know, I've learned so many cool details here. And even in this last couple of years, as Chad has said, in the last few decades working in the energy system here in Alberta, learned so many of the details, but I feel like I never know enough of the details. A lot of it is evolving, uh, but the energy space, the mixing even with the climate space, you know, there's so much science, social science, politics, um, we're all having these conversations in real time, like Larissa and Sean are demonstrating. But yeah, it's some of the details, I guess I, I learned today, I really liked this. Um, I learned some stuff from the chat. I heard the Husky CEO said, we don't, we don't have a, we have a surplus of pipelines. And Terry Ross responded that uh, we need more narrative technology. And I think that's pretty apt. Like, I, I feel like the bottleneck these days um, for the industry I'm a part of, oil and gas, I've been a part of it all my life. And I feel like the biggest bottleneck has been our narratives as much as the, say, the pipelines. The pipelines have been a bottleneck at times, certain places. Again, the devil's in the details. But for the narrative piece, I feel like the devil's in the high level brush strokes of us just punching anyone that says we should decarbonize, you know, and fighting against the notion when in fact we have been decarbonizing for a long time. The carbon markets that Sean walked us through, um, we started those in Alberta in 2007. We were the first in North America to have such uh, markets. And, and I love that economic solution of uh, incenting and rewarding low carbon fuel. So we've been doing that um, for a long time, but um, yeah, now that the global financial markets are kind of pushing towards decarbonization, it's so dangerous to, to fight against foreign funded uh, sources uh, of, of that same perspective that uh, are fighting for low carbon future. So uh, I really like the, the little details I've learned here where, you know, illuminating some of those pockets, a lot of the things we're already doing, like uh, so many of the panelists mentioned, you know, Judy and Kevin have ex incredible examples about how we're already innovating. Um, so those are some of the highlights for me. And I'd say as a personal takeaway, you know, just, really appreciate the, the kind of constructive focusing on the possibilities. And um, yeah, thanks for coming together and, and illuminating some of those um, really a nice change of pace. One, one final thought is uh, I learned from another person that the smartest person in the room is the room sometimes. I really appreciate the frame that we're coming at here and that everyone's participating in this unique way. So th thank you very much for sharing with me. Thanks, Ryan. Some good uh, takeaways there, one-liners. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn now to Atif uh, Baskandari. He's um, executive director of the North Pine Foundation, former um, ED of uh, startup Edmonton and also a fellow of the Energy Futures Lab, Atif. So I'm going to start off with a, a very short story in that I, I'm the son of a refugee who had to travel to Japan to study chemical engineering, which funny enough, he had to learn Japanese in order to study it, to then come to Canada with a master's of chemical engineering, uh, only to be in the very precarious workforce, which is the oil industry in Canada, which meant every four to five years, he would be laid off. And we have this joke in my family with my mom being the immigrant mom, where you would want your kids to be an engineer. That would be great. My mom was scared to death when she found out that me and my brother wanted to be engineers. Because for her, that was not a sustainable livelihood. That is what she experienced up close and personal with every four years having to lift up our lives and move somewhere else in Canada. I grew up in Newfoundland where the idea of stable work is precarious in itself. Uh, and the reason I want to start with that because when we talk about energy and climate change in Alberta, I think we should dive a bit deeper into this conversation to say, what is the problem we're actually trying to solve here? 
Are we actually talking about solving climate change or are we talking about a labor market crisis? And I know people can say the and and the or, but actually there's two different strategies for doing that. And I'm here, and as I heard the speakers talk and in these breakout rooms, some things came to my mind, which is once we really understand the problem we're trying to solve, it's asking ourselves, who are the ones who can help us solve the problem? So if we say climate change is actually the problem that we want to solve, do we have a Bangladeshi fisherman, their voice in the room when we're having this conversation, someone who is tangibly impacted by it, or even people here in Alberta, as Larissa mentioned, uh, the many people who have been affected by the energy industry and by climate change. If we are talking about innovating for the sake of climate change, how do we put those people who are facing the brunt of climate change at the center? If we're talking about innovating for the sake of a labor market crisis, then we talk about how we put those people who are facing the brunt of that at the center of the conversation. So it's different strategies, but that all that to be said, it's this is a play that we have to attack from many different angles. So how do we create a platform that allows us to be flexible and engage these opportunities wherever they may come and invest in the change makers wherever they are with the best ideas that they're coming forth with. So that was one of my key takeaways. Great, thanks Atif and appreciate the, the personal story there that puts it all into context as well, thank you. Okay, um, we have four minutes left and uh, I have one more of the closing reflections from, uh, from Najwan Aljunaid. I hope I said that right. Uh, <laughs> I should have learned by now, Najwan, um, who's with the um, Energy Futures Lab. And then we actually have one more uh, closing uh, presentation as well. It'll just take a minute. Okay, thanks, Chad, and hi, everyone from Treaty 7 here in Calgary. Uh, I heard a lot. This was a very rich conversation, so just a few takeaways here. Uh, lots of questions around what is our role in the energy transition, and this is happening. This is no longer breaking news. Um, change is hard and scary, uh, especially when uh, real people we know are losing uh, their jobs every day. Uh, in my breakout room, we talked about the emotion of it and how it's overwhelming to have this conversation. But we need to find our place in this transition. This is what I heard from everyone almost. And it can be leadership. Uh, we can be leaders and not laggards. Uh, we can leverage on what we have. We have the talent. We have a skilled workforce. And we can work, we can build uh, on this legacy uh, to build new energy transition uh, pathways um, that will help us reduce emissions at scale and in, in different sectors. Uh, so it's time to scale up. There are trillions of money, I hear, uh, invested in, uh, to be invested in low carbon initiatives. So let's not miss on that. Uh, second thing I heard is we are stuck in polarization and this com conversation does not need to be binary. It's not either or, and this is something we strongly believe uh, in uh, the Energy Futures Lab. Uh, I want to quickly go through a few things the panelists shared. So Judy talked about sustainable finance, and this is important because the markets have spoken and investor trends are signaling the need for ESG measures in energy investments. Uh, Sean, the math was impressive on that Excel uh, sheet. Uh, I see uh, that we have a, a very high carbon footprint per barrel compared to others, uh, and we need to reduce our emissions fast and at scale to reach the, part, the, the Paris targets. Uh, so in a way, I see the moral of the story is to look uh, at what others are doing outside of Alberta and even outside of Canada to reduce our emissions. Uh, Ed talked about using public money to develop and deploy new technologies and industries. Uh, it also means uh, capturing as much as, uh, as possible from the wealth that we have in the oil sector to remain competitive and putting it toward the profit drivers of the future. Uh, Kevin talked about solutions being um, the solutions for the pressing uh, problems in energy and climate. The, the answers exist within the oil and gas sector and Alberta is in that unique position to solve them. So uh, the markets are ready, let's do it. And I wanna just end with one thing uh, Lori in my breakout room said, um, there is no reason for us not to be prosperous in the future. I thought that was well said. 
Okay, thanks, Najwan. That's great. Um, Steph, uh, if you could just put up the one slide, uh, it's about where we're going next. I'll just show that before we have uh, Wakefield Brewster uh, send us off with a poem. So this is um, just a reminder, I guess, of if you want to find out more about the next 30, you can go to the website, uh, sign up for the newsletter. And there are three upcoming sessions. You see them there, Health and Wellness on February 17th, the Provincial Budget on February 24th, and Talent on March 5th. There'll be more as well, but those are the three next ones that we have scheduled. There'll be an evaluation survey that comes to you by email, and we really hope you'll fill it out because it really helps us to improve the sessions for next time. And we just encourage you to share what you've seen and learned and thought about here with your networks and on social media and so on. But um, even though we're at the five o'clock, I think I predicted we might be right at five when we turn to Wakefield. Um, Wakefield Brewster's uh, one of the members of the Possibility Panel. He's a registered massage therapist and also a, a poet and spoken word artist. And he's composed a poem to uh, conclude the session with. Good evening, everyone. This was a big discussion and there's a lot of divisions in it. That's what I learned. Not everyone's on the same page and that's, that didn't need to be said, but that's where we are. And one of the greatest things about me being able to contribute to this discussion in the best capacity that I have is as a poet and spoken word artist. So we're looking at energy, we're looking at climate, everything in between. And to me, it has a gigantic impact on environment. So the poem that I would like to recite to you guys today is called H2O. If you'd like to, as I've said before, please close your eyes and embrace the spirit of radio and uh, see where this poem takes you. This is a flagship poem of mine that was uh, inspired by the um, Walkerton water crisis. So here we go, H2O. There once was a time when we flowed like rhyme. Ebbs and tides flowed on our insides. We took no free rides. We just rode waves and dug sacred graves because we knew the earth saves. And when we dropped to our knees to drink out our seas, shores, eventually we ended up creating sea sores. As we gazed into the depths and only saw the surface, the face of folly to come. We drank our own reflections with gluttonous vanity, gulp down gallons with thirsty profanity, drain in drops like three pointers, pollute and then shoot into the earth a dirty needle. The sewers beneath are the burning veins of acid rains, sludge and sickness pumped through pipes. Walkerton walked in medical plights, blacked out some lights, then led to court fights. And while the poor fight for it, the rich want to whore it. We'll make you pay, we'll make you pay. The flow of H2O, we gonna keep on the stay locked up. They ain't gonna die for the supply be stocked up so damn your creation of the canal suez and neglectful flex on the exxon valdez because oil and water they just don't mix but slicks and puddles gives kids heads tricks they think that it looks pretty you see all the colors now they can finally touch a rainbow and make it dance like a beautiful woman. But once again, the image of life is washed, washed away. Back to murky and muddy waters, our oceans sing the blues. Environmental channels hype to bring the bad news that we're all gonna lose and I'm getting too confused because I used to drink my water from a bottle. I heard the vehicle of pollution was choking on the throttle. Then a rumor went about, I could just not believe. I spelled every and backwards and found I was naive. My gut is on the grieve. Believe you me, I'm enough pain, G. I first thought that I contracted ileitis or colitis, but from the water cooler, I drank gastroenteritis. You see how mother nature spite us? She did it, she done it, and she'll do it once again. She'll fool us into thinking we can cheat our fated end for we put the pain in her reign and then showered her with disrespect. And we gon' thirst worse unless we get our shit and check because when the oceans all evaporate, we can't make juice from concentrate. No fluid moving up and down in the locks. 
No creamy whipped potatoes from a cardboard box. We are damned and doomed ourselves a drunk and dry demise in the stretching of the skin and the bulging of the eyes because nobody tries. We'd rather drink lies. We hold fast to mistakes of the past, latched to the ludicrous and not liquid life because we can't let go. Forget what you know. We've forgotten how to flow like water. Right. Wow, thank you very much. Thank Wait, you. Bill, that was amazing. Thank you very much. Happy Black and History we, Month, everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you along the way. <laughs>